start that. change that to this okay I go back here <coughs> I'm here let's see back on you back on do 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 Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Meadows and Makers podcast brought to you here on MSP Waves. I am Greg Dowd, your host, known as Make It Stuff, in the Hive community here. And hope everybody is having a wonderful week and things are going well for you out there. Got a show tonight that we're going to talk about a couple of different topics. And centering around what I've been working on lately. Um, if you guys have been listening for the past few weeks, I have been steadily working on a aquaponics project where I am revamping a project that I worked on with a friend of mine, Robbie Olson, a while ago. And he helped me build the frame and we milled lumber to build the frame for this thing. I thought I was going to set it up on my on my property and we did. We we got it initially started out there and let it sit out there in the elements for I don't know, probably a couple of years. It was sitting out there. I didn't treat the wood or anything like that and so when I when I got out there and picked it up recently, I guess it's about a month ago now, that uh, a lot of the wood, some of the wood had rotted out and there was some repairs that I needed to make. The uh, The aquarium tank that was in the system needed to be worked on a little bit. It had areas where the silicone had separated from the from the tank and so or from the bottom glass of the tank and so I had to go back into the um the system and figure out how I can repair the aquarium tank. So for the past, you know, a couple weekends I've been slowly working on it and uh we're going to talk about that tonight what I've been doing to repair the tank and get that part of the project done. Um, the chickens are doing really well. The, I have, they're, they're leveling up right now. They're going from like the, like initial stage Pokemon, like the baby Pokemon to whatever the next level is. They're all like, they're like growing their feathers out. They're getting like their full wings coming in. So they're, uh, they're eating food like crazy. <laughs> they're the chick starter I've been feeding, feeding them. They've been just gobbling up like crazy. So, uh, so that's happening with them. And then, uh, I have been cranking up the, uh, CAD design software, uh, free CAD to kind of get back into doing some, uh, computer aided design stuff. So I'll probably share a little bit of that with you tonight. Um, probably give you a, at least a live like view of what FreeCAD looks like in, inside the software. And it's uh, one of those things like if you kind of understand, uh, I'm not familiar with how to use the tools in FreeCAD, but I, I am going to start teaching myself some of the stuff and 
start going through some tutorials and, uh, but the basics, I, I learned the basics when I was going through college. So, and it, it's kind of like one of those things where it's like riding a bike. It's like you, you kind of are familiar with different tools. What's up, Rondon? Um, that's cool, man. Uh, well, hopefully we'll see you a little bit later for the podcast. But uh, I am recording this. It's also going out live to YouTube and to Odyssey for other for other folks out there. So, um, so I can see your chats if you pop up on either one of those places. I was in a, a YouTube timeout because I uh, angered the Ministry of Truth. So <laughs> the so so-called ministry of truth here on, uh, the old, um, uh, YouTube. So they, uh, they s smacked me a little bit there, but, uh, you know, it happens and it's just one of those things you gotta navigate away from the, uh, you gotta navigate away from all of the uh, words that you can't say on there. So anyway, I'm back live on there tonight. And then I'm also on Odyssey. If Odyssey will let me sign in. <laughs> so it looks like they had to do something to allow me to sign in and now I've signed in. So that's great. So good deal. Um, and let's see if we're, let's see if we're up and running on there. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. Let's just continue. And, uh, Let's see if I can share out the stream with other folks. And it's hard for me to figure out exactly how the live function works through Odyssey sometimes because it's like you publish it, but then you're like, am I live? We're doing it live. <laughs> We're doing it live. And so I'm not quite sure how I check on all my live and everything, but it looks like I'm live. Actually, I got it pulled up here. Looks like I'm live. All right. Good deal. So let me share this out to the twit the twiters and uh, let me... Um, let me send out the live stream links here and then we'll get into it because, uh, we going we going to talk about some stuff. I, I've been tumbling down the rabbit hole a little bit when it comes to biochar as well. So I wanted to, uh, talk a little or share some content that I found that would be pretty valuable about biochar. <clears throat> so, we're going to talk about that for a little bit tonight as well. But let's see. Let me open up for you guys the... Uh, and talk... In the beginning here, let's talk about, you know, working on this aquarium tank. So, let me scroll through all these photos. I think it's kind of... Um, I don't know if I can kind of show a progression here with the photos on the Twitters. And I don't even know if I've documented the whole the whole process, but I do have quite a few that I can can scroll through here that we can talk about. So, let's see. Let's start with this one here. And let me pull it up for you. So, here we go. That should be it. All right. So, here is the, pretty much, this is the completed frame of the system. 
and on the on the bottom there, I went down to the property and picked up some of these poplar boards that I had milled into basically they're I think they're like eight foot wide and then they were like 22 foot long because they came off of some trees off of uh, the parents property here that we fell and then we loaded in a trailer and I brought it down to a friend that has a sawmill and got a bunch of these cuts so that I could do like a like siding for a cabin board and batten style and the bottom of this frame it was basically just a bunch of two by fours laid out so like you were gonna frame up a floor and so I needed to cover that because there's gonna going to be a sump tank full of water in the bottom of this frame here and I have an airplane flying over me <laughs> right now that sounded like a jet or uh, a missile an incoming missile so that uh, that freaked me out a little bit but uh, but I'm back so anyway uh, here's a look at the aquarium tank that's that's sitting here on top of the frame and what I had to do to get this process started on fixing the aquarium is take a, a razor blade and I had have it sitting here on top of the frame of the system and scrape all of the old silicone out of the joints where all the pieces of glass touch each other and the side uh, the sides of the aquarium look like there is the silicone that um, connects each piece of glass there's a good bead of silicone that is holding them together quite well so once I scraped the surface silicone off I uh, I left those side pieces intact but uh, getting to the bottom of the frame uh, of the aquarium on the bottom piece of glass what I had to do was run a razor blade all through the bottom part of this uh, plastic frame and it's it's just a plastic frame for this aquarium a 55 gallon aqua uh, aquarium tank and it's just a plastic frame and the sides had had cracked and that's where I, I noticed that the water was leaking out initially was on the side where the plastic frame had cracked and it's it's my fault because I left this aquarium tank out in the elements and it, and it was it had water in it and the water probably froze and then it kind of probably bulged out the plastic frame on the bottom a sun exposure and all that stuff couldn't couldn't have helped so the plastic was kind of worn out and it had cracked and then and then after that crack happened then it looks like some water flowed through there and it kind of pulled some silicone that was sealing that bottom piece of glass against the other pieces of glass and it had it had pushed that silicone out so after I got after I removed that bottom part of the frame by running a razor blade through and breaking that contact with the silicone against the glass uh, from that plastic frame, I was able to take that that plastic piece off, and then there was nothing left but the bottom plate of glass and the silicone that connected the. Um, that bottom plate of glass to the other pieces of glass on there. And I had to just run a razor blade uh, through that connection to remove that thin layer of silicone that was still there uh, to be able to pull that bottom sheet of glass off. And actually while Bill, Billy was over here last week, he helped me do this. And uh, so together we, we scraped that silicone off that kept those pieces together and uh, we're able to get all that silicone material off and then flip the bottom plate of uh, the glass up onto the, the frame here of the system. 
and uh, then I was able to uh, clean it really well. I had to scrape the the places where that silicone was uh, previously and scrape it really well with a, a really sharp razor blade, like a brand new razor blade is what I had to do. And, um, and once I got all that old silicone off, I came back and wiped it all down with uh, first some vinegar, uh, with paper towel and vinegar, and just wipe those surfaces really good with paper towel and vinegar. And then uh, came back with some isopropyl alcohol and paper towel and really wiped down those areas where that silicone was. So that was really nice and clean, a really nice clean surface. And, um, and then what I had to do to follow that was, um, I had to, now, now you can see the bottom of the tank here in this picture with the frame off. And this was after the cleaning procedure and all that, uh, that I had to put a bead of this type one silicone is what you want to get. Um, there's a type two silicone that's for, for outdoor use and it's for like sealing windows and all that. And it has like an anti mildew additive to it, but you don't want to use that if you're going to put fish in an aquarium tank. And so, uh, I won't, went and got this GE type one silicone, uh, which doesn't have any of that stuff in there, uh, and got the clear, clear type silicone. But what I had to do is put a, a nice thick bead along the glass there on the side pieces of glass. And then on the bottom piece of glass, what I had to do is take a, a nitrile, I put on a nitrile glove and then I ran a, a bead across you know, that whole profile of the out, outer part of the glass where, where it's going to meet the other glass. And then I just took my finger and I, I just made a thin um, layer of that silicone and spread it so that it would definitely cover that entire area uh, where it's going to meet those other two pieces of glass. And then all we did was uh, I got my dad to help me with this and uh, he grabbed the other piece of glass and then we just set it down on top of the, the um, aquarium there and just let gravity sink it down into the silicone and waited for it to cure and then uh, a day or two after I came back with the razor blade and I trimmed off all of the excess silicone that had smushed itself out after we put the glass down. And so, um, uh, crossing my fingers that this is going to work. And if not, I'll repeat the process again and see if I can get it to seal, uh, well again. But, uh, that brings me to the last piece of the equation on fixing this tank. Uh, well, there's, there's a few more steps that I need to do, which is, is to re silicone the inside of the tank, which I'm going to do with, um, I'll put some masking tape down. I'll run the bead of silicone on the corners there on all those corners. And then I'll take, uh, put a, put it like a nitrile glove on or some kind of, uh, glove. So I don't get the silicone on my hands. And then I'll just run that my finger up that uh, that corner to make a nice smooth uh, bead of silicone. There will be part of the final step, along with repairing, like I said, that cracked frame, uh, that cracked plastic frame. And what I did for that was the other night I uh, jumped on to. And downloaded FreeCAD so that I could CAD up a couple, well, I CADed up like four little brackets that I could use. Um, and I printed out of uh, that PLA Tough material. And what I'm thinking is is uh, to scratch up the surfaces uh, pretty, pretty good on both sides of the 
little L brackets that I made out of the PLA and then scratch up the frame there where I'm going to put some JV weld down and stick those brackets to the plastic frame and clamp them on there and let it cure. And I am hoping that those added brackets and and JV welding that onto that plastic frame are going to make it strong again so that it pretty much repairs this plastic frame that got cracked and um and once I finish that I'll be able to flip it all over re-silicone all that 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 bottom part of that frame and stick it back on to the bottom and um hopefully it'll all work <laughs> it'll all hold together it'll all fit back together well and uh, the aquarium will be sealed again and we'll be able to move on to the other parts of the project, which are uh, the completion of the, the full system. So, uh, so that's where I am on that project. It's been quite, uh, it's taken quite a bit, bit of time to, to work on it and I've just been steadily working on it so that, uh, <laughs> so that I can finally finish the project and get it into the, the local maker space. Uh, from Chris Walls, the, the um, gentleman I, I interviewed and introduced you guys to uh, a few episodes back there. And uh, so, so it's going to be on display, the, the system that was designed by Robbie. And uh, I showed Robbie some of the progress that I've been doing on, on this project. And he's uh, getting... Uh, excited again about uh, seeing that project come to life and he has worked on a 3d model of the thing that he wants to put up on his uh, website so that people can you'll just get like a you'll get like a link to the the model as well if you like purchase or like download the plans and stuff is what he was talking to me about so um, so, uh, we talked about that over the weekend after, uh, I showed him some of the, uh, progress that I've been making on the, uh, the whole system. So, uh, so that has been going on and that's, uh, that's what I've been working on over the past weekend as well as, uh, monitoring all my fish or not my fish, my chickens, the little baby chicks are doing good uh, as well, and um, they have been cranking on their growth. They have been growing like crazy. They got little parts of their wings that are coming out and looking like they're going to jump out of the, their little box that I got them in for their brooder right now. So uh, it's, it's pretty <laughs> cool watching them. When they're going to bed too, they like all kind of huddle up together and they'll uh, fall asleep on each other. It's like a big uh, uh, dog pile. <laughs> they kind of all dog pile together and sleep on each other. Uh, I do have one that still has an attached yolk sac, which um, I watched a video on on how to treat that, and I've been treating that little chicken with. Uh, daily putting some coconut oil on it but the coconut oil is supposed to be like antibacterial and antimicrobial and after a while that yolk sac that was still attached from them like prematurely hatching basically is what I think happens and um, sometimes that yolk sac can still be attached to them and, uh, I lost one of the, er I lost one of the chicks that hatched because I introduced it to the rest of the chickens and it still had that yolk sack attached. So, I uh, unfortunately I had to put him out of his misery and cause the other chickens that attacked, attacked that yolk sack and they kind of like pulled it and it like pulled its intestines out with it. And so it, anyway, it was really sad and I, um, <clears throat> unfortunately i had to get rid of the get rid of him 
And, uh, but the, there were two other ones that that happened to. So I isolated them and I've been treating him with this, uh, coconut, uh, coconut oil. And the one little chick that had it, the, the attached yolk sac fell off and it's, it looks like it's healthy. It looks like it's running around and everything's good. And the other little guy is still having uh, some issues with the yolk sac being attached and he's really, and uh, he or she is really small uh, compared to all the other chickens. And so that's kind of a bummer. I hope that one will grow well and it's going to start doing really good, but um, it's, <laughs> um, unfortunately it's, it's, it's kind of, slow uh growing right now so but what's up gabriel what's up crimson clad good to see you guys uh see every time i see this stuff it convince me convinces me that i can make wild wildly shaped aquariums <laughs> yeah i have a, a guy that works with our company that's up in nashville that he helps install and helps uh, maintain very large, uh, very large saltwater aquariums, and uh, those are really cool. Uh, just to have a cool factor for tonight. Uh, all right, here is an avocado tree <laughs> joining me on the podcast. So check out this avocado tree. This has been growing inside. Uh, this was a gift from uh, Robbie. And he, they started this with a uh, avocado seed in a smaller pot and I transferred it to a larger pot and, uh, it's been sitting inside the, this little patio area, sunroom and staying warm in here and continuing to grow. So hopefully I'll have this avocado tree and make some of my own avocado toast in the future <laughs> i don't i don't know i, I haven't even i've never had avocado toast so i don't know but um i do like guacamole <laughs> so <laughs> well, i'll have some guacamole for uh burritos and such in the future <laughs> uh yeah the aquariums are beautiful. It's awesome to watch the fish. There is something relaxing about watching the fish and having that in your home. And uh, the cool factor is is definitely up there. So, uh, but uh, but yeah, they do require maintenance. Um, but talking to the uh, guy up in Nashville, he. He has some. He has this set up so that it's all living bacteria that are pretty much taking care of the system for him, and he's not having to add in any extra filter media or anything like that. And once you get this natural bacteria started, I guess in the system, and you're and you're inputting only like uh, reverse osmosis water, you know you have. Uh, really good quality water coming into the system and all this bacteria is working well and all that, then you're pretty much hands off after you get the thing up and running. And it's, it's really, it stabilizes and everything uh, starts to stabilize. I think he has to come in every now and then and like uh, remove some of the solids from the system. But uh other than that, like he's got living coral in there and he's got like a bunch of different types of fish in there. And, uh, I think he has one, some, uh, anemones and some clownfish in there as well. It's like pr pretty wild. Like everything, you know, all that stuff is really, really wild. They, once you get it going, it's, it's really neat, uh, to look at and everything. So. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to show you guys a little, uh, a little bit about, uh, free CAD tonight because I just opened up the program recently and what I, uh, what I'm learning there 
is all about, um, you know, riding a bike and getting back into doing some CAD design stuff and just really simply built the uh, little brackets to 3D print. And it, uh, it took me a little while because it's not so intuitive. It's not quite like some of the other programs I've used. But, uh, but here's a little peek at it. And this is the modeling software that uh, it's open source and you can download. You can uh, go, to, go to the FreeCAD website and you can download the program. Well, let me pull that up for you guys and share the link with you. But uh, but yeah, it's it's all in open source development, and you can contribute to the people that are building uh, the the code for it if you like to donate to it. But uh, but if you'd like to play around with CAD, it's a it's a free software that you can download and it uh, has quite a few uh, cool cool features so um, so this is the part after uh, I extruded the the drawing so like I said it's kind of like riding a bike and when you uh, when you get into doing this stuff you uh, you kind of kind of walk back and kind of remember like how things go and uh so basically whenever you're building a part in in three dimensions yeah you, you start off with a sketch and so uh so like i said i'm just playing around with this right now but that's that's how you would start is uh you would go into a sketch and on here, I can kind of like uh, like pick a surface to sketch on. Uh, if uh, if I do this right, it can kind of like pick a surface I can sketch on, and then uh, let's see, create a new sketch, and it asks you what face you wanna you wanna work with, and I gave it the selected face there, and let me see if I can. Uh, maybe make a, a little, maybe make a little sketch on the surface of this guy and, uh, we'll, we'll try, we'll attempt an extrusion, uh, or, a a, a cutout. Now, uh, so I want to zoom in a little better here and... I wish I wish I had a little bit better familiarity with this, but I'm just kind of playing around here, playing around, just seeing what uh, seeing what we can do here. And we're gonna sketch just a little box in this thing, and it's kind of gonna I just use my use my Bob Ross or my uh, if I go if I go real low like this, it's probably like a probably more like a trump voice but uh using my trump voice here we're gonna make happy we're gonna make a happy box and uh and then we're gonna see if we can extrude the box so or we're gonna we're gonna cut a hole we're gonna see if we could cut a hole <laughs> all right so so we made our box there and uh, so we're going to move from sketch to part, I believe, and, and maybe not, maybe not. Uh, let's go back to Sketcher, and then let me see what else. Uh, let's see, view or edit. Let me do box selection. Let me select. No, that's not what I want. But, uh, all right. So, anyway, 
<laughs> uh, I'd have to play. I need to play around with this more and watch some more videos and stuff. But uh, but yeah, that's the basics on how you would uh, you would you would get started. And you know, I could draw a design on here and make a cutout into the thing, and then uh, from that cutout, I can take that and and export it into uh, and what they call a, a uh, standard tessellation uh, file uh, or a, a, a .stl file. Uh, so you would go into uh, export, you would export that file, and then there's a whole list of ways that you can export the file. Uh, for uh, 3D printing, you want to select uh, STL mesh for that and then save the file as a... a uh, .stl file and then you, your slicing software for your CAD program or sorry for your uh, 3D printer program can pick that up and it can um, be able to uh, you'll be able to throw that in your 3D printer and start printing whatever you designed so so there's just a little look at that. Just I've been playing around with it. And uh, so I was able to take that file and then just move it over into the uh, my slicing software. So let's see. Let's see if I can bring that up for you and kind of show you how that came out. Um, so I'm using the slice slicing software that I got with the... 3D printer, it's called Lubon, and it is the, the program that is able to create the machine code for the 3D printer for the, uh, the Snapmaker 3D printer that I purchased, and so, so in here you can uh, see that it, uh, it performed its uh, slicing functions there, and let me see if I can. I forgot how to, how to zoom in on this guy, and it's not that. Uh, but this is what allows me to pull all this around, and uh, let's see. So auto zoom. So we can zoom in on the part there. And so the, this is how I printed all those brackets. I gave it a brim support to, uh, I like using that, uh, the brim support because it attaches your print really securely to the, the plate that your, uh, your build plate. And it's gonna you're gonna see any issues that you might have with your extruder with your nozzle uh during the print when you uh, do this because basically it's gonna only do like a single layer high of the material that you're printing and you could see any defects in the nozzle like sometimes you'll see bubbling happening which i believe is due to uh to the filament having too much moisture in it, you can see stuff like that. You can see that, um, like maybe the filament's not extruding all the way. Uh, that could have uh, a factor to do with the le your level of the bed. Um, it could also uh, have something to do with the little uh, uh, extruder motor that is grabbing the filament and pushing it through the nozzle. There could be issues with that, which I ran into uh, at one point uh, where I had to unload the filament and then reload it because there was a portion that got kind of stuck and it, and it didn't want to pull through all the way. So, <clears throat> so that's why I like using that brim to start off the part with. And uh, yeah, here in the slicer software, after you've completed the slice, you can kind of look and see how it's going to, uh, move and do each layer by layer in the software and um, this print took about nine hours to complete just these four little brackets so um, 
I just took that one file and then just co copied it into the slicer four times and printed them out. And they came off really easy and easy, easy to use. <laughs> so that's just a little, a little peek at how you could, you know, do that yourself. And with all these, these tools are all free online. So, uh, so yeah, I've got, I've got a lot more work to do when it comes to, uh, learning how to use this free CAD, uh, because it's not as intuitive as some of the other programs that I've used. Um, I have used Autodesk Fusion 360 is probably the most familiar one that I, I was in the past. I was probably the most familiar with. But that's the basics if you're going to do something in a, in a CAD software. is you, you First, you have to make a sketch. And then from your sketch, you can, you can um, create your 3D model. And um, by using the extrude function. And then you can make it more complicated from there by adding sketches to the surfaces of the thing that you just made you know, a, a part in three dimensions and, um, you know, you can add curved surfaces on things and all, all kinds of other, uh, tools where you can, you know, refine your design and everything. So I wanted to, uh, shift topics here. Uh, that kind of covers everything that I've been up to lately as far as projects go. And playing around with all that, with the CAD and uh, with the aquarium and all that stuff uh, that I wanted to shift here and talk to you guys about uh, biochar tonight. Uh, I've been looking into this whole world of biochar and it has been uh, fascinating me. And there's a creator that I found that uh, gives it, you, you a rundown on what you can uh, use to make uh, this biochar stuff at home. And so I want to pull him up. Uh, biochar, uh, retort, or biochar reactor, DIY biochar reactor. And this is from the creator on YouTube. Uh, his name is Porterhouse and, and Teal. And this is the video I'm going to show you guys this is right here. And I'll throw this into, into the chat. But, uh, oops, that was free cat again. Sorry. Let me go back to the link I'm trying to share. And, uh, not really sure. Not really sure why it's doing that, but okay, here's the link. And then here we go. All right. So let me open let me open that window now. And let's get let's go let's go back to the camera only while I'm doing this. I'm setting up the next scene for you guys. Actually, Got, I have to use that. <laughs> I can't. I can't switch it for you on on the fly while I'm while I'm masking what I'm doing. All right. Uh, here we go. There we go. And let's go back here. So, this is from the channel Porterhouse and Teal, and he's actually got a whole little playlist here on biochar. So, I'm actually going to open up this whole playlist, why, but I'm and um, uh, we'll, we'll watch this and learn together here because I am uh, looking to set up one of these little biochar retorts to. Uh, start creating my own biochar because of all the benefits that 
you looks like you can get out of this material or out of this out of this biochar when it comes to agriculture and and permaculture so uh especially when you're growing chickens and this uh this guy porterhouse and teal uh i was looking through some of his videos in the playlist today for biochar and he's actually using it in his uh ch- with his chicken bedding and basically just he gets the stuff wet after he creates it in this uh in this retort and he's got it's a really simple setup it's basically a 55 gallon metal drum with uh like basically like half inch holes and several half inch holes uh drilled into the bottom of the metal drum and then he's got some smaller holes up at the top probably like quarter quarter inch holes uh, and fewer of them up at the top of the metal drum. And then inside this 55-gallon metal drum sits a 30-gallon uh, metal drum, which is where you're going to put all your wood that you want to turn into this biochar material. And how that works is, uh, from what I understand, um, you do have to drill some holes in the bottom of the 30 gallon metal drum because as this thing heats up and what it's doing is uh, bringing it to its ignition temperature but in the absence of oxygen it will not combust and so it's what it's going to do is it's going to drive off all the gases and all the steam and all the water and all the uh, organic uh, gases that come in that are inside that wood and it's going to drive it out and then combust those gases as they as they leave and what you're what you're left with is just like elemental carbon at the end and it's extremely porous it can hold like seven times um it's uh it's weight in the uh in water and so it's super absorbent um in the beginning, they're saying that it, it actually is hydrophobic and it wants to drive water away uh, until, um, until I guess, uh, you, uh, you kind of so somehow you can get it to become hydrophilic so that it's wanting to attract water, which happens through this inoculation period. So you have to um inoculate the biochar with some kind of like uh like charge it with microorganisms in some in some kind of fashion and one of the great ways of doing that looks like it uh is to feed you know have it be partially a feed for animals and the feed um uh when the animals uptake this biochar material it can actually help cleanse their systems and it can help them fight disease and a lot of stuff. So, uh, allegedly. So, uh, so hearing all those claims and, uh, you know, made me really fascinated with this stuff and trying to figure out how to make it for myself. And so we're going to watch this video here about, uh, him talking about how you can build this for yourself and uh you know goes into some detail about it he even goes into how he's using um like bones uh from uh some of the animals on the on the homestead to turn into biochar as well and uh so he's got some good videos in here i was watching them uh for a little bit after i got off work or uh, right at the end of the day there at work and uh, just thought that these were some really good uh, videos to share with everybody so let me give him a like there and let me go ahead and subscribe to him and let's uh, let's play this video I'm kind of dying to try this stuff I'm probably gonna probably gonna give it a go so 
thought that I would document this uh, for a couple of reasons. One, just to let the people know that I've been telling, hey, I'm going to be making this biochar, um, kind of what I'm doing here. And then two, yeah, I don't know if this is going to work at all. Uh, it's something that I kind of did a little research on and I thought, well, hey, that's a good idea. Maybe I can do that. Well, I guess we're going to find out. But uh, um, I'm excited about this project because the only thing that it's cost me is time. 100% um, of everything that I'm using is no cost to me, um, including both barrels, including the flu that uh, I just happened to be noticing alongside the road. And I asked a guy about it and uh, he said, yeah, it's yours if you want it. It's just going to go into a landfill. So um, I brought it home and I'm incorporating it into my uh, retort system here. And then I located and procured uh, feed stock to put into this. So again, these are cut ends from a mill that is, you know, just allowing people to come and, and grab this. Otherwise it would be, you know, either burned or disposed of. And I, I really do like the idea of taking something that's going to be, um, you know, discarded and then putting it to good use. So I'm hoping that's what I'm doing here um, in this process. But again, it's, it's all new to me. So uh, I'm going to bring you along and... Uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I've been able to run several batches through the system now. Um, I think I've got it kind of refined pretty well, and it's uh, given me some, some good char. So uh, let me kind of explain the process of how you make good char, first of all. Um, in order to uh, really make good, clean char, you need to do so through the process of pyrolysis, and that's basically heating it up to its ignition temperature, pushing off all of the gases, um, essentially burning it without oxygen. There's the 30 gallon filled with feedstock inside the 55 gallon drum. The lid will be placed on that and sealed and then all of this space going around will be filled with feedstock all the way up to the top. The fire will be lit, will go down, it'll heat up the material inside the 30 gallon. The gases will start to expand, they will off gas, come out along the side, they will come up to a point at which the fire is burning down, and then they will again reburn. So I'll go ahead and uh, fire this thing up and make another batch, but uh, yeah, so far everything's working good. I've been really pleased with it. A few hours since uh, since I lit it, it's pretty well cooled down by now, at least externally. So let's open her up and see what what you wound up doing. Sounds deliciously metallic. Oh, yes. That's glorious. Well, one of the ways you can tell that you've got good quality char is that there's there's absolutely no ash it's completely black and it has a very distinct almost glassy like sound to it very metallic and um, one of the other ways you can you can tell is that it has no smell and it has no taste and uh, I don't know why, but I'm kind of dying to try this stuff. I'm probably gonna probably gonna give it a go. So
made biochar with uh, some of the other methods, um, cone pit, and just doing some things with, uh, you know, pulling coals out of the burn pile and trying to quench them. Uh, but the nice thing about this system uh, is it's pretty self-regulating. Basically, you can just light this, come back sometime later in the day, um, and uh, it basically self-extinguishing. So from that aspect, it's very kind of hands-off, and I really like it so far. Uh, I'm going to continue to make this stuff and incorporate it into uh, some of the projects that I've got going on around here. So this is the first step in taking and turning this charcoal into biochar. We kind of put it out where the livestock can step on it and then as we sweep up their manure and uh, wasted feedstuffs into piles, um, that'll be incorporated into um, our composting systems. So that was really important. Uh, what he said there at the end is that, you know, he's incorporating it into his composting systems and he's putting it around his animals where they're, they're bedding and all that stuff is that, uh, that's important if you're going to make this and the, uh, the stuff that's fresh out of the, the, the retort that he made there, it will, uh, hmm. Uh, it will not be good or beneficial for the soil right off the bat. It needs to be inoculated uh, somehow. Um, so let's look into, he goes into a, a little bit better explanation into. Uh, I'm going to show you how you can make bio. How this all works in, in one of the other videos here. Oh, dang it. <laughs> I screwed that up again. But let me copy that link and throw it down in there for you guys. So he shows you in greater detail in this video on how the whole system is set up. Biochar from ordinary bones. Yeah, after the chickens have their way with these bones, I'll fish them out of the compost pile and then ultimately I'll get them over into the retort. I would like to show a little bit more detail about what's involved in the process. I did have a few questions in the last video I did wanting some clarification. So I'll see if I can provide that in this upcoming video. And uh, let's see if we can't make some char. I'm going to go ahead and talk about each one of these individually and get in a little greater detail. Okay, this is just a regular lid out of a 55 gallon drum. And it's not attached mm. in any way. I cut it pretty precisely so it just slips in and it's a very secure and tight fit so I don't worry about trying to secure it uh, beyond that. It really doesn't leak anything as far as any um, gas or smoke out of there so very simple on the lid. The drum itself has a series of holes drilled in it. I've got holes at the top but I've also got holes at the bottom. The holes at the bottom are larger in diameter and, and I have more of them because I want the air primarily coming in from the bottom rushing up to the fire that's been lit at the top so that's where my air is going to come in plus that's also going to be where the the majority of the exhaust gases being pushed out of the 30 gallon drum are going to burn and they're going to need a place to to escape yeah, each one of these builds on something like this is going to be pretty unique so there's really no formula to it it's just something that if you're going to try something like this you're going to have to experiment and and find out what works best for you but i, I think that i've got a pretty good uh so i think that first thing was just a stove pipe that you could get for you know any kind of wood stove uh just a section of the stove pipe that and you, you don't, you just need some kind of like, you know, metallic cylinder that you could put in there to give the, the, uh, the heat a way to travel up and through there and to create that air draw is primarily why, uh, that stovepipe is there, I believe. Pretty good understanding of how this barrel, um, needs to be configured to have it work how I want it to work. Okay, the 30 gallon drum is going to be loaded with feedstock and it's going to be placed inside of the 55 gallon drum. The lid will be placed on top. 
Once this is filled with feedstock, I place something heavy on top of it while it's in the barrel. Is Once the fire's lit, it's gonna be coming from this level, from the top down. It's gonna burn down, burn down, burn down, burn down uh -huh. until it gets down enough to heat up the contents of this. And what's gonna take place there is it's gonna basically go through the process of pyrolysis, meaning that it's gonna burn in the, in the absence of oxygen. So there won't be any real oxygen in here. It's gonna be starved in here from oxygen. So as this heats up to its ignition temperature, it's going to drive off all of the gases. And essentially what you'll be left with is a form of pure carbon. The beauty of carbon in that form is it can no longer decompose. And what they found through studies is it can last thousands and thousands and thousands of years. That's really cool. So you make this stuff and you apply it in your gardens and, you know, uh, add it in with your chicken system. Even if you've got a coop and you're doing like bedding in their coop, like you can use it as the bedding, um, partially as their bedding. And after they're done with all that and everything, uh, that, uh, you scoop that out and you can use it in your gardens and it's going to last for a really long time, way beyond your lifetime. And, um, so, uh, really cool that the folks that discovered this type of stuff, uh, there's a documentary that was made about, uh, regions of the Amazon, where they found this soil and they call it uh, terra preta and it's like a regenerative soil and uh, it was made through uh, the people in the past doing similar kind of stuff of creating this biochar and then um, adding other organic material to it and compost in their compost and uh, they created this really amazing soil with it. And, um, you know, now that we look at some of this stuff, we can kind of explain all the, you know, actions that are, or better explain all the actions that are going on because, you know, this carbon material, when you look at it under a, uh, scanning electron microscope, you can see that it's has all these pores and all those pores are where, um, all these different microorganisms colonize and those microorganisms help to <clears throat> create a their own like make metropolis in, within this carbon material and they help create you know ways of transporting nutrients and other things that plants may uh be looking for in kind of a communications network in the soil um, so, you know, it's kind of the magic that's going on, uh, underneath all this. Now you might ask, well, isn't that going to become a problem as the stuff inside here heats up? Well, that's why I have simply five holes at the bottom of this one in the center. And then there's one, two, three. So he drilled five holes in the bottom of the 30 gallon metal drum, uh, that were all three eighths uh, of an inch diameter, uh, for the holes in the bottom of that, uh, 30 gallon drum that you're going to put your wood that you want to, you want to pyrolyze or turn into biochar or on the outside of this and that is more than sufficient to allow that gas to come out mind you there's there's feedstock that will be stacked all around this and on top of this so again as the fire is lit it's going to come down this will heat up to the point where it drives off gases those gases will escape and as it gets to a certain level it will burn again and then it will burn the remainder and it will essentially put itself out and what you're left with is just pure carbon pure charcoal and then at that point you can go ahead and inoculate it however you choose to inoculate it and and turn it into 
uh, effectively biochar. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and load this up and, and uh, allow you to see that process, and then we'll fire this thing off and see if we can't make some char. Now, one question I would have with this is that does it matter the size of the feedstock material that you're going to use? I do know that you want to make sure that it's not um, that it's not just a, like something that you just chop down, like a, a tree that was green that you chopped down and that it's still got a lot of water content in it, I, um, that you want to make sure that you, you dry it out and you use it. Um, after it's been dried out very well. So the other question would be, you know, what is the size, is there a size determination on, uh, what you need to do to put in this, in this feedstock, uh, barrel? Like, uh, I would assume you wouldn't want to use too large chunks of wood because it would, might be more difficult to drive all of the, uh, all of the gases out in one burn you might have to do multiple burns if you had a larger larger pieces of uh of the feedstock that you were using but uh but those are a couple questions and something i'll have to experiment with myself and again there will be feedstock that will be placed in here as well all the way up to the top of the 55 gallon drum if i stack the wood in there in too much of an organized fashion i wind up with a much less um, complete burn. But when I use random sized pieces of wood, I tend to get more uh, of a complete burn. Okay. So he did, he did somewhat answer that question there by using the, the random pieces of wood, uh, random sized pieces of wood. He gets a more complete, uh, burn out of it. Coconut shell and some bones. Let's see what they do. I'm gonna go ahead and put a heavy weight on top of that now. And I'm gonna go ahead and fill the rest of this up with feedstock. If you don't put enough fuel around the 30 gallon um, there's a good chance that what you're going to be left with is, is an incomplete char. So you want to try to get this space completely filled up. So it's kind of like playing a Tetris game um, by random pieces, stacking them in there as best you can. But I like to leave a little bit of room here in the center just so that the, the stack has a bit of room for so it can nest down in there. I usually grab some brush or something that I have nearby that's dry that I can use as a kindling. Once I place the lid on, I put a stick Propping it open in this fashion, and once the material on the inside of the inner chamber becomes sufficiently hot, it's going to begin to force out all of those gases, and then they're going to ignite and reburn in the way that you see it here. Well, it's the next day. Let's take a look, shall we? So you can see how this was yesterday was full. And uh, it's been at least reduced in volume by about half because of all of the, the water's been removed, the gas has been removed, and 
any impurity within the wood has been removed, so therefore it's been reduced in volume. And this is pretty typical of what I've found. Here's some bone. That's pretty wild how it like carbonized that bone really well. So he's basically talking about how you can do this with uh, a lot of different organic matter. Um, you just take it through this pyrolysis process and, you know, it's going to depend, you know, on where you're using, you know, the, the volume that you end up creating at the end. Cause like, if you just put grass or something like that, like dried grass or something in here, I believe that you should be able to carbonize it, but you're going to be left with like almost no volume because <laughs> there wasn't very much to start with there. Coconut shell. more bone pretty cool some good looking char Please subscribe and leave me a comment if you have any suggestions on what you do within your system or if you have any further questions on what I do in mine. So listening to another podcast where they were going into this, uh, there's a gentleman from um, a company that he makes biochar. The company's name is Blue Sky Biochar, and uh, I'll pull that up for you guys uh, real quick here. And he was describing the optimal um, size that you want to make this biochar is around like 10 millimeters in size. <clears throat> and, and he was uh, describing how that you, you basically s can sift it through like a couple of different size, uh, sizes of hardware cloth material and then get it down to the 10 millimeter size that you uh that you want and so you just need to work it after you've carbonized the material then you would need to extract that and then you need to sift it down to uh to around a 10 millimeter particle size and he was describing that as being the most the most efficient size for uh, for this stuff. And, uh, and these guys make all their stuff out of uh, a lot of their stuff out of bamboo. And because it grows so quickly and that you can, uh, you know, keep using it over and over again. And he's also talking about uh, one of the other byproducts is this bamboo vinegar. And it can be a good... Uh, like thing that you can spray on to keep uh, like pests away. It also helps stimulate uh, plant growth and um, is a really interesting uh, substance. And in, in the in the the vinegar is is a byproduct of uh, doing the biochar, I believe. And uh, so pretty pretty interesting um he did a podcast episode with uh jack spearco and i can't remember the gentleman's name in this but let's see what's michael michael whitman is the uh the gentleman 
that uh, introduced me to this. I had known about biochar before, but, uh, you know, him describing going through all the benefits of it and, um, got me excited again for wanting to learn more about it. If you ever wanted to know what biochar is and then you've attempted to look it up or had somebody try to explain it to you in very scientific terms and your eyes just gloss over, I'm going to explain to you in layman's terms what it is, how it's made, and the things that it can be used for. Stick around. So what is biochar? It's just charcoal. It's charcoal that's been created from biomass through the process of pyrolysis. Biomass is nothing more than living. Uncle Bonehead, you can make you can make this stuff at home, and that's uh, the videos that I've been sharing today. Is uh, all about how you can make it at home, and with uh, just some pretty basic stuff. Uh, you just need a 55 gallon metal drum, and then you need a 30 gallon metal drum and uh the 30 gallon metal drum has five holes drilled into the bottom of it so that the gases can escape uh as the outside material that you put in the 55 gallon drum burns and um you know that's how you would create this stuff at home and you can pick up um down limbs things that are in your yard that would you know be yard waste uh that you know would take a long time to decompose uh or like uh porterhouse and teal channel here uh what he did was he found the um the end cuts at a lumber mill and he talked to the guy and asked him if he could take those and uh where it would otherwise just be burned and and just turned into into ash there or uh you know he put it into good use to make uh to make biochar so uh yeah i saw, I saw your chat pop up in there welcome uncle bonehead good to see you man yeah so uh, you know i'm going down the research rabbit hole on uh because that's what i wanted to know i wanted to know okay, how can I make this stuff at home? And it's got so many great uses, uh, especially if you're raising animals. Uh, with this uh, with this porterhouse uh, and teal guy uh, and his channel is doing here is he's uh, giving you a demonstration of how he uses it at his homestead and he adds it into uh, the bedding of his animals and um, is... Uh, allowing like his animals to step on it and do and manure and everything and he mixes in with the manure and lets it compost and then you know after it's gone through this composting process and been inoculated then it's good to put on his gardens or around trees uh, it holds on to water so it can help retain water on your property it's got a lot of different cool cool uses it can um uh keep keep your help keep your animals digestive systems healthy uh because it can help pull like toxins and stuff out of the environment um there's just so many great uses i've heard that it can be used to treat uh um you know wastewaters it can help pull toxins out of uh like wastewater and and uh and all that stuff like uh they've helped it in like toxic remediation sites and things like that <clears throat> they've used it for so there's just a lot of different cool uses of it and <clears throat> and you can make it at home so <laughs> yeah yeah uh, neighbors cats or trials and molesters work as ingredients yeah <laughs> Uh, anything that was living, supposedly you can turn into biochar. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I guess it would be convenient for all the, you know, the child molesters after they were put through the wood chipper. They'd be in nice sized chunks. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, let's continue to listen to this video where he explains more about it or recently living organic material. In the case of making biochar, 
quite commonly what is used is wood, but many different substances that were once living could easily be made into char. Now, there's a number of different thermochemical conversion processes used in making biochar. However, the vast majority utilizing wood as a biomass is made with the process of pyrolysis. So what's happening when we make biochar? This material undergoes a form of thermal decomposition. It's decomposing due to the heat that's being applied. And that process is called pyrolysis. I'm gonna explain now the difference between pyrolysis and combustion and what makes this different from what you get out of your wood stove or your fireplace. Organic material undergoing the process of pyrolysis and you will be left with this. Organic material undergoing the process of combustion and you'll be left with this. What's the difference? The difference between these two is that this has undergone that thermal decomposition in the absence of oxygen. So in order for a fire to occur, you need three things. It's called the fire triangle. You've got heat, you've got fuel, and then you've got oxygen. If you remove any one of those three things of the triangle, a fire cannot occur. This needs that third element, and it doesn't have that. It's got the heat, the fuel exists, but there's no oxygen. So this can no longer burn, and what you're left with is you're left with a very, very pure form of carbon. Now there are gonna be some residual oil and some residual tars and things like that, but essentially this is very, very pure. So what's happened in this instance is that this has been heated to its ignition temperature. When it reaches that ignition temperature, it starts to off gas and it starts to drive off all of the volatile gases that are flammable. I've experimented with and had some limited success with some of the different processes that are out there where you build a pile, burn it from the top down, and before it turns to ash, you want to go ahead and quench it and then extract your charcoal from there. I've experimented with the cone pit. I've experimented with the trench method. However, the system that I've currently had a lot of success with and I've settled on is the biochar retort. If learning more about that system interests you, I'll put a link in the description directing you to some of the videos I've made on how that system was designed and how it operates. The thing I like about the system that I'm currently using is it's very hands-off. I can essentially light the system, come back the next day, and I've got high-quality char and I've had very limited interaction with it from the point at which I light it to the point where I go ahead and collect it. I do not have any experience using a kiln, but I thought I would mention it in the context of this video as another option of a closed system that is used quite commonly for pyrolysizing wood for biochar. I think it's important to note that biochar got its start more than 2,500 years ago in the Amazon basin. The indigenous people in that area at the time had discovered this dark, rich, fertile soil that had nutrient and water retentive qualities highly sought after for growing plant matter. It's called terra preta or black earth in Portuguese. And aside from its moisture retentive and soil building qualities, it has a lot of other specific uses and I'd like to go ahead and highlight those now. One of the very unique things about biochar is just it has an incredible amount of porosity. The surface area of one gram of well-made biochar is said to be equivalent to a half of an acre or 2000 square meters. One of the beneficial uses of this is to remediate both soil and water. Biochar is negatively charged, so it's going to attract positively charged chemicals and or nutrients. It's gonna draw those elements into the char and it'll be retained. The thing that's pretty cool about biochar is just that it's environmentally friendly. This piece of char could potentially be around for thousands of more years. It's a really effective way to take a waste stream, something that would ordinarily either go into a landfill or just naturally decompose into the atmosphere and sequester it in a way that it does something beneficial by putting back into the earth. Before inoculation, char in this form needs to be crushed. And ideally it needs to be crushed down to a quarter inch in diameter or smaller. Crushing is another important step, but it takes time. And I generally do it in kind of more of a passive way where I will either crush it in the wheelbarrow or I will put this in a feed sack and then walk on top of the feed sack. I've created a video detailing that process. I'll put a link as well into the description. One thing that's very important that you do before you add this to your, your soil as an amendment is that you preload it or you inoculate it. It's very important that you do that because again, this is a blank slate. This is very, very absorbent with all that pore space. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna have a negative effect if you take something like this and put this directly into the soil. It's gonna actually draw nutrients away from the plants 
who are competing for those nutrients. Here's a list of some of the items that. Uh, Uncle Bonehead, uh, no, you don't want to. You don't want to compress it. You just want to like break it into uh, these uh, finer particles. And uh, a word of caution with that as well is that you don't want to breathe this stuff in. It's gonna it's gonna create all this powder, and w when you're you know uh, turning it into fin those finer particles, when you're uh, breaking it up into those finer particles. You don't really want to breathe that uh, dust that come that comes off. You don't want to breathe that into your lungs. So you'd want to wear a mask or something like that to uh, to protect your lungs. If you're you know once you've created the the good char and uh, and then you start to break it up into the smaller particles. Um, but yeah, you don't really you don't really need to compress it down. There's some uh, lawn care companies that uh, that make a product uh, where they it, they take some of that uh, biochar and then uh, they comp it does uh, it does look like they compact it into uh, uh, these little pellets so that they can put it into those uh, like seed spreaders um, or the fertilizer spreaders for your lawn. And uh, I think it's from a company called uh, Anderson, and they make a product called Humichar, and it's a uh, humid ac humic acid and biochar mix. And um, the cool thing about their product is that uh, that you can disperse it into your lawn by throwing it into one of those seed spreaders. And uh, and if you want to uh, improve the soil on your property, then um, I have a I have a friend that's been applying it to to his lawn. And here in Alabama, we have a predominantly clay soils, so the water tends to run off of the soil very quickly, and we don't retain the water very well uh, here. Uh, and he's been using this Humichar product for uh, uh, at least a year now um on his lawn and it reduces the amount of water he's got to use uh and his uh grass is healthier and it also looks like it's helping to turn his uh clay soils into more of a loam uh loamy uh black soil and so uh that's another pro product that can help just like overall increase the quality of your soil in your area um, and then I think it also helps to improve sandy soil as well. So, um, it may be used to inoculate your char. It's not as important on which of these items that you choose. So he's talking about a bunch of different ways that you can inoculate the char after you've, um, uh, after you've created this at home. And, uh, I guess one of the big, the best, probably one of the best ways is to add it into your compost. If you're, if you have like a compost system going of some kind, um, they're also talking about like, if you have a worm bin and you have, uh, um, you know, you, you're, uh, you've got like a compost worm bin system going, you can add this biochar in with the worms and then, um, it, will uh you can collect it from <clears throat> the worm castings and it's like really really good um he's also naming uh the c90 uh stuff which is like uh, trace minerals from like uh, like sea salt i guess i believe is is that c90 stuff it's a bunch of trace minerals azomite that's another one of those that's uh i think is a uh, kind of a uh uh, some different trace minerals. <clears throat> and he's saying you can use your urine to help inoculate it. Um, and then uh, the, you know, adding it in with animal bedding would be a good idea as well. If you have some animals and then they're, you know, they're peeing and pooping and all that. And you add it into their, their bedding. If you have like a static uh, 
chicken coop or something like that, you can add it into the ground with their bedding and it helps inoculate the biochar, which then you can use to help fertilize all your plants and improve your soil. Um, so let's, uh, let's finish this little video here and, um, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll drop the link in here for the, uh, the other video that, uh, the blue sky biochar, uh, gentleman was on. And then we'll also, uh, drop the link for that chemochar product as well. That worked, uh, really well for, for my buddy, AJ. But it's important that you choose one of them. Essentially what you're doing is you're filling up that pore space with something so that that pore space isn't going to be thirsty for the nutrient and competing against the plants that you're trying to grow. A natural byproduct of this process is when this cools, tar and resin will solidify on its surface, essentially making it hydrophobic, meaning that it will not absorb water. So it's very important to try to get that hydrophobic property uh, lessened or completely eliminated by introducing it to water. I typically don't worry too much about that issue because it's gonna remain in this compost yard this char that I've crushed is going to wind up being in the chicken yard and it's going to have plenty of time for all of those resins and oils and tars to break down and then the inoculation process is going to take place. It's going to be in that compost absorbing nutrient from the compost that's been generated in that yard for at least two months. The two primary ways that I inoculate my char is I'll put it directly into the compost piles or I'll utilize it as livestock bedding within my chicken coops. Utilizing the char in the bedding areas of my chicken coop has a couple of different benefits. It's going to absorb the nutrient from their manure, but it's also going to absorb and reduce the amount of odor that comes from that manure. They seem to like it quite a bit. If you're interested in learning more about biochar, click now to enter my video playlist. Yeah, so that's kind of a rundown of all this uh this biochar action <clears throat> they're kind of learning along with me because uh i'm looking to build one of those those retorts <clears throat> and uh i do have most of the stuff that i need for uh making one of those things <laughs> yeah you ever you ever drink a lot of coffee and then you go to pee and then you're like pee smells really like well, all that coffee you drink <laughs> Uh, all the <laughs> pee would do it very good. Way too much leftover, uh, uh, caffeine and beer. Yeah, man. There's a lot of, uh, I, you know, I, I got off of, uh, the energy drinks a, a while back and, um, recently I've been drinking them again, kind of getting, kind of falling into some bad habits lately. Uh, also, started smoking again i started uh over christmas i had a couple cigars and then it got me hooked on smoking again so i guess i just gotta leave them alone all together and that's the only way to do it you gotta just go to cold turkey and not mess around with it anymore but let me see if i can pull up this humichar product for you guys because this is uh This is one of the ways that you can um, you can use this product, you know, directly on your lawn. They've already kind of got it all set up, and they have um, this like uh, dis it it just like disperses when it uh, uh, when water hits it. And they've got these like little pellets that you can use to distribute. Um, so let's uh, let's see if we can look at this. Let's video. face this it, might we be all want that beautiful lawn, a good way, a golf describe. course quality lawn, thick, green, healthy. But fertilizers are only half the story. Your soil holds the key to plant health. It's the lifeblood of plant nutrition. The only way to fix your soil is to add carbon and humic acids. The only way to do this effectively is with Humichar. Humichar is a unique blend of biochar carbon and humic acid. 
It's then formed into easy to apply granules that are clean, safe, and certified organic for use in lawns and gardens. The patented DG particles are amazing, and as soon as water touches them, they disperse into millions of microparticles. This is why Humichar can reach the roots versus other brands that remain on the surface for months. So that that's, uh, I guess, the key to their little technology here is that they have these little dispersible granules that you can throw into uh, a little hopper and, and distribute ar- around your yard and everything. But, um, but yeah, anyway, my buddy AJ has been using that and uh, has said that uh, it uh, has helped out his lawn quite a bit, so. I'm going to share that with you guys. <clears throat> yeah, holidays. <laughs> That's exactly when it happened, man. It was over the holiday. I had kind of celebrated with a cigar. And uh, now I got hooked on them. But uh, that's my fault. So, um, let me look up that final thing that I wanted to share with you guys which was the interview with uh, the interview with uh, Jack Spierko and Michael Whitman here on uh, biochar and this guy had several uh, you do need there were several moments in this podcast that were just like uh, mind-blowing to me and there were just like several moments in here that were just right, where this guy was explaining some of the benefits of all this stuff and it was just kind of blowing my mind But, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, let's listen to a portion of this and then I'll drop the link in the chat for if you guys want to look into it further. Because it got, it renewed my interest in this whole topic of, of biochar. So, um, so yeah, let me play a portion of this for you guys of this uh, podcast episode to finish us up for uh, tonight's episode. I am back on um, the YouTube. I got a strike for uh, medical misinformation. And uh, so the Ministry of Truth was uh, gave me a little bit of a PP slap there and said that uh, we don't like uh, we don't like you looking into certain things there, boy. What you reading for, boy? <laughs> and um, and so I got I got a timeout. It's like I was I was talking about this with with some some of my uh, friends, and I was just like, it's like they're acting like your parents, you know? This they want to put you in timeout for a little while, teach you your lesson. <laughs> Uh, but we all know YouTube sucks, uh, Facebook sucks, all those uh, major platforms, they really suck. And uh, that's why we're you know, using alternatives like Hive and Odyssey and um, IPFS and, uh, you know, get spreading the signal as far as you can on the alternative platforms. Um you know, I, I like the the decentralized platforms a lot more, uh, like the IPFS and Hive and um, Odyssey. Uh, you know, there are ones like Rumble, and then you got Rockfin, and uh, yeah, Float is another one. Um, but uh, but yeah, the I think the more decentralized we can make it, the better. You know. Um, you know, platforms that uh, have some kind of centralized location that are speaking out against the system. You know, there's somebody that can take that or act to try to take that down. 
I know Odyssey's in a, a total battle with the SEC because, you know, they're, they're a company, but they're not, you know, they're like, uh, <laughs> you know, they're also uh, technology. So, you know, yes, three speak, them, bit shoot. Vigilante TV, Cast Garden, D2, Brighton, BitTube. Those are all other uh, decentralized places that you can uh, get your content out to. So, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, lots of other stuff out there. And uh, just remember to record. <laughs> Because they didn't give me anything. They just, uh, I always record all the stuff. So that episode, I uh, actually, uh, that, uh, that episode I loaded up to Odyssey so you can watch the replay that they, uh, they, uh, they nuked it. So they were just like, uh, we don't like what you're saying there and, uh, we're deleting the video. So, um, so yeah, there's, it's, it's the replays there on Odyssey. And it was the uh, the power lies on your side, and I was talking about some no no things, <laughs> apparently. But that was the episode where we got into all the books uh, that we were uh, watching on uh, the Grand Theft World podcast, going into uh, and looking up those books where I was looking up a lot of the uh, the books live on air, and. Um, uh, the episode was primarily about uh, covering uh, the podcast interview with uh, Richard Grove and Jay Dyer, and um, he had just uh, Jay Dyer had just come off of an uh, interview on uh, on Tim Cast IRL, and he was uh, actually getting to explain some of the history of how we got to the point that we are right now, and some of the books that he had read to get us to that point and uh and in the episode there was a couple of books that jay recommended uh one was a book that uh, like if if people really want to get a, a picture of kind of like what the what these guys want to roll out in the future i think one of the books was uh between two ages was the big new brzezinski and then uh the other book was uh the one that uh, Klaus Schwab put out. Um, I can't remember the title of that book right off the top of my head, but uh, it was one of the more recent books that Klaus Schwab had written. Um, and let's see, Klaus Schwab. books uh oh yeah here it is i have it uh, i think i have it pulled up uh shaping the fourth industrial revolution uh klaus schwab uh with nicholas davis and you can find it um on <coughs> libgen.is uh you can download it there so uh Yeah, and then I kind of got into some of the topics about the jabs and and uh, and that's what got me. That's how they got me, man. They got me talking about the jabs because they can uh, through the the algorithm, I guess. It's looking at all your speech and then it's uh, converting your speech to text. And then if no no words come up in the in the uh, text then it automatically gets you uh sent in the algorithm feed to uh get your get your whatever your videos <clears throat> taken down so uh so yeah you gotta just like navigate and use uh new speak so that you can <laughs> and make innuendos uh so that you can stay on the on the youtube platform so, uh, so yeah, anyway, that happened, but I'm back. I can stream again. They just timed me out for a week and, uh, but now I'm back and, uh, 
talking about uh, talking about biochar and stuff. <clears throat> so, uh, but that you know that's uh, that's what my channel is all about is trying to spread so some more solutions on things. Uh, but I do get into some current events, topics, and stuff that I think are uh, are relevant to. You know what's going on with the the path that's uh, going ahead of us, and um, last week I had on uh, my friend Billy, he's a local friend that got affected by all that tractor supply feed. Uh, that <clears throat> that episode is also up on the uh, the Odyssey channel and the replay if uh, if you weren't here for that uh, that live stream. But uh, but yeah, you can go check out. Uh, my channel there on Odyssey, and I think, uh, let me see if I can, uh, pull up the, if I can pull up that episode, I can share that here in the chat as well. So, uh, but yeah, he talked a little bit about that tractor supply feed and his, uh, the effect that it's had on his chickens because he's been raising uh, his chickens from little chicks off of that feed that he was buying from tractor supply and it, it had been over 10 months that his uh, and his chickens were still not laying eggs and then he went to a local uh, uh, grain mill place that's over in Gunnersville, Alabama that mixes that they mix their own feed there and uh, he got his chicken started on that on that feed from the local uh, grain mill and uh, said that they got back got back to laying for him so or they started laying uh, his chickens so uh, he was able to uh, solve it by going outside the big box stores to get his feed so I would say you know like a majority of folks that are doing this for the first time they are probably going to shop at track supply to get their feed so um, it may not necessarily have all of the stuff to, uh, feed them, but there's, uh, we went to, into some different solutions in that podcast and on how you could, uh, some alternatives to finding feed for your chickens, you know, feed them more food scraps, uh, mix your own feed, uh, Doug and Stacy off grid with Doug and Stacy had a really good video on how you could uh, create your own feed mix. They talk about putting uh, sunflower, their sunflower seeds in there. Um, they actually, I think they grew some millet that they uh, put in with the feed. Um, there's, uh, you know, guys that are going to restaurants and, uh, you know, showing up there and uh, asking if they can take some of the, their food scraps to show up, uh, on a regular basis to pick up their food waste and, uh, use that food waste in uh, a composting system. <clears throat> Cause you don't want to say that you're going to feed it to animals, uh, because they can, uh, get in into liabilities. The, uh, everybody's afraid of getting sued nowadays is, uh, how it was explained to me. So you don't want to go to a restaurant owner and say that you're going to be feeding this to animals. You want to tell them that you are composting the food waste and uh, in doing your part to help the environment and make the world a better place and uh, make a good sales pitch to them. <clears throat> uh, so... So yeah, people are getting creative on, on how uh, they're feeding their animals or um, in order to, uh, especially with inflation and all that. And, uh, you know, there's permaculture ways of being able to uh, use your, uh, to basically like, uh, you know, not have or, or really reduce your outgoing waste and be able to use everything that you have on your property to compost and uh, be able to turn into feed for your animals. And then um, one homesteader that's a really good resource for that is Nick Ferguson. He talks about a system on using rabbits to uh, <clears throat> help you uh, bring in like black soldier fly larvae will come in with your 
uh, the rabbit poop and everything, and then you can collect the black so soldier fly larva. You can use that as a feed for your chickens. Uh, you can also grow mealworms, and you can feed them like um, oats that you can buy in bulk, and uh, they like feed on the grain, um, or they feed on the oats, uh, and they uh, um, that's what the mealworms uh, will feed on, and then you can have those. He says he has them in his basically in his hallway in his house, so. You know, not everybody wants to do stuff like that, but, <clears throat> you know, there's de there's definitely uh, several ways of being able to produce your own high-protein feed and get around, you know, trying to get some of this feed from some of these box stores and stuff. So, so yeah, we talked all about that in that last episode. And, uh, you know, if you wanted to get straight to that point, because uh, – uh, we did get an interview with uh, Billy at the first part of it and kind of got uh, to uh, learn about some more of Billy's story in the first part of that episode. But uh, at the end, we go into the old tractor supply situation. So in that second hour, we go into that tractor supply situation and then uh, some solutions on what you can do for uh, for feed for your chickens and everything. So... Uh, I wanted to get back to the interview here with uh, Michael Whitman. We've got about 10 minutes left in the podcast tonight. And uh, I highly uh, recommend listening to this, this full episode because it's like, you know, especially if you want to do this uh, bio trial on, on your property, you want to learn more about it. Uh, that uh, you you know spend a couple hours listening to this episode and then you know I I think you'll be uh, very interested in uh, trying to trying to figure this out for yourself. So uh, kind of aware stuff. So yeah, I want to play just a, a portion of this uh, toward the end here. I believe I was able to get a question in on this one. And uh, they were able to field it for me in regard to uh, using this with uh, a chicken a chicken tractor system that I'm going to implement. So uh, so yeah, we'll listen to a portion of the end here, and then uh, we'll close out the show and wrap it up with you guys. And uh, so so yeah, I appreciate you guys coming to hang out with me tonight, uh, Uncle Bonehead and Crimson Clad and Gabriel. Thanks for hanging out in the chat with me tonight. And uh, yeah, we'll wrap it up here, and I'll uh, say my goodbyes, and then uh, we'll uh, that'll be another episode. So here we go. You know, all us do-it-yourselfers, these things are common, just common sense to us, you know. And some people will have an experience to go, oh, really? Is that really work? Yeah, it works. It's, you know, it's so, yeah. So um, by incorporating the biochar into the compost, you're going to sequester some of those greenhouse gases. And by putting the blanket on top, and it's only like an eighth to a quarter inch, you don't need a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, we didn't mention earlier, though, the percentage of biochar in the compost. This is a pretty important question that I haven't heard anybody ask as of yet. And the range is anywhere from five to 20%, although you could do more. Um, five is not much. I like to be about 20%, 15 to 20. Okay, that is important. I don't think I covered that tonight. It is that uh, I get, it does look like there is a certain percentage that you want to stay to of your mix to uh, biochar to your compost material is uh, is. Uh, Michael Whitman here, who's had several years of experience with this stuff, is saying that you want about 5 to 10% of a mix in with your compost. In there, so that when I harvest my compost, I can actually see the little granules of, of biochar in there. And again, we're adding rock dust, we're adding EM1, Bokashi, I mean, coffee, uh, manures, I mean, so many different things. The more broad spectrum you put into your compost the more you get out of it so just simply composting food waste and yard waste is workable but if you want to take it to another level add more ingredients that are in there just make sure you maintain your 50 percent carbon and your 50 percent nitrogen as much as possible 
Yeah. You know, so yeah, you get and I think people need to realize too that percentage of your compost is then going to be watered down by the percentage it is of like a grow bed when you put it out, right? It's they, so if you're at twenty percent of carbon or biochar in your compost, once that goes out to the garden, you're not at twenty percent in your garden now. So that's no, one no. that's going to be that high. Right. But it gives you the opportunity to keep adding biochar to your soils. Sure. Because, you know, you can't really overdo it. There's no real point at which biochar is going to cause a problem. Now, is there a point at which it won't do any more? Yeah. Sure. Um, what, that, what that is, is not, and there's no one answer to it because it depends on the biochar, the feedstock, the soil. There's so many variables that will change that around that we can't just say, oh, yeah, it's this or that. Sure. Um, and K-Bonk's asking about rock dust or stone dust. Like, I, I've heard you mention that several times today. Like, yeah. all of those things are good to include in this inoculation. Uh, I've used kelp meal. I've used uh, liquid seaweed uh, as part of my inoculation because there's a ton of minerals there. Yeah. So what happens is a friend of mine um, several years back, probably eight years ago, came to me and he said, yeah, we're, you know, mineralizing soil. And we... So, uh, so yeah, that's part of this whole inoculation is to get those like residual tars and everything off the surface of the, uh, of the pyrolyzed, uh, you know, feedstock that you're using, uh, wood typically, but, uh, but yeah, it's going to leave behind these residual tars and everything. And so, uh, you want to get that stuff stripped away basically. And so they're saying that, uh, you know, the way that they're inoculating is through, um, you know, kelp would be a great one because it's like got a bunch of trace minerals from the ocean, I believe. And, um, so that would be one way to do it. And then I, this inoculation, part of this inoculation process is stripping off some of those tars and everything. So that it becomes, that absorbent material uh and you like allowing it to uh become that absorbent material and then not try to pull any of the other stuff from the environment that you're you know trying to plant it on it's not going to try to pull any of that stuff away it's already like it's happy because it's already full basically started to blend a few different ones together azomite granite basalt uh leonardite a few different things and he said it works much better it gives a broader spectrum so i started playing with it and we put out a product called uh blue sky uh complex rock dust blend and we started out with seven then we went to nine then we went to 11 we went to 13 now we're only at 12 because one of the ingredients just became very difficult to find so we blend all these things together and we pack it up in five pound bags that does 250 square feet. And uh, there's quite a few different ingredients in there. I think it's, yeah, there we go. The label is much nicer. We have a new label for it. Yeah. Um, also, it says on this package, it could be good for three to five years. It's really only one to three years. We, we, we've redetermined that. Um, and you use about a pound for every 50 square feet at a, at a minimum application rate. And this stuff is off the charts amazing. Now, when we do growing beds for food, we use this. But when I work on landscape jobs, this is too expensive for that. So we sure. just use azomite by itself. But azomite, granite, uh, I mean, there's just so many different things in here. And it just creates a much broader spectrum. Minerals are so important for root zones, microbiology, and creating cell structure. All life on Earth requires minerals to build cell structure. So minerals are very important. And most people are really not mineralizing their soils or analyzing them. I don't do that much analyzation of soils anymore, except on certain projects where the... the... All right, there you go. Yeah, adding in minerals uh, can really help out, uh, especially in your gardens. Uh, this is where you're growing your food and everything like that. I saw uh, Gabriel hopped off there, so but uh, thank you so much for coming to hang out uh, in the chat room tonight. And uh, thank you, Uncle Bonehead and Crimson, for, for hanging out with me tonight. Uh, uh, we'll see you guys next week for another episode. And um, it's been a lot uh, of fun. I hope uh, you guys got uh, something out of uh, the episode tonight. 
uh, talking all about biochar and how you can make it on your own and uh, a little bit about how I uh, I did my uh, my Trump my Trump Bob Ross voice <laughs> and reselling the the aquarium and all the work that I'm doing on that um, so yeah go out there get some stuff done you know be the inspiration for yourself and others and uh, you know let's uh let's try to make the world a little bit brighter of a place to be so thanks again guys and uh we'll catch you for another episode uh next week and uh, we'll see if i can get uh get a guest on for you guys again and uh have a wonderful week and we'll catch you uh we'll catch you later go Go uh, subscribe to the Odyssey channel if you haven't already, um, as uh, the the YouTube channel keeps getting, or probably going to keep getting taken down. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, thanks for being here. We'll catch you guys next time. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Peace, guys. Sad face.